Well, welcome everybody to our nice uh, school mind group because let's face it, sex and relationships up the stairs behind a wall, but uh, <laughs> who's going to find us? Um, so welcome, my name is Lauren McCombie Smith. I am, um, I actually am not that local, but I'm from Nottingham. I know, like a rival. <laughs> um, and I am a, I'm a youth, I'm a youth worker, that's my main area of expertise. I um, work for a, a secular youth charity in Nottingham running uh, open youth clubs and youth services in City Centre. Um, and I also work for Frontier Youth Trust, who are uh, these people. Uh, so we are a home for pioneer youth work. We are a national charity that supports people to do youth work on the margins. We're all about um, supporting people to go to the edges of community, edges of society and church culture and engage with those on the edges. That's our, that's our big passion. So we work with people up and down the country doing very strange and wonderful projects, really. So um, yeah, and so uh, yeah, and they asked me today to come along and do a little bit of a conversation on sex and relationships. Um, yes, and as I said, we're going to use Menti. So this is a really great tool. Um, it's there's, I will try not to talk forever. So there are bits where we can interact and, um, as well on Menti. So yeah, if you haven't found it yet, go to the website and put in this code and you'll get my presentation. Um, it means that at certain slides you can input your own info, which is really great. Um, yeah, so a little bit of a... Uh, oh yeah, but also, you know, uh, I want you to get involved and have a conversation. We obviously have that conversation in the room, but I'm aware sex and relationships is a fun conversation that us British people aren't great at. So actually, if you don't want to have a conversation, Menti allows you to type. It's a bit like having a chat thing on Zoom. You know, you can just type it instead of actually say it, which is helpful. Hello. Hello. Oh, hello. Um, oh, do you know what job is coming to mind? Oh, um, so, yes. Uh, oh, I thought it's done that. Okay, good. Come back. Yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah, so sex and relationships. As I said, I'm aware this might be a little bit awkward for some of us. Maybe not, but for some of us, um, it's not something that we British people are brilliant at. And our education system hasn't been the best historically. It still isn't the best historically. It's very hit and miss. Um, so we ourselves might have some issues with the subject. Um, and in that respect, I also want to issue a trigger warning from the beginning, like that this is a complicated subject. And it could be triggering for some people, and I'm aware that there probably are people in this room who will have had traumatic experiences around these subjects. Um, and in most rooms we talk about, that does exist. Um, so uh, I just want to say that, you know, I see you, God sees you, that um, your pain is valid if that's you, and if the church is in any way fed into that um, problem, that trauma, then you are over an apology and that, um, I'm sorry that happened to you. And if for any reason anyone's like, you know what, I need to step out for a minute, or I don't want to keep carrying this conversation, that's fine, feel free to take yourself off, there's lots of places you can go and sit, and come back in if you want to or not. Um, yeah, so that's just my, my little trim win first. So, my first question is, is it our place? to have this conversation. Because I think a lot of time in more Christian circles and in church uh, youth groups and things like that, we often think maybe it's not our place. This is not our place to have this conversation. But I think my big message is, yes, I think it is our place. And here are my reasons. Um, so yeah, we know that uh, as youth workers and children's workers, that uh, in the culture that our young people are living in is constantly changing. Um, and at a pace that us adults sometimes can't keep up with. Uh, their exposure to the internet and social media um, has exposed them to an entire world that many of us just haven't been exposed to before. Um, young people are no longer just competing with their friends, they're also competing with the Kardashians because they have full access to their lives as well. Um, you know, so it's a whole different landscape than we had. Um, and you know, number one, my number one reason why I think this is our place is that, in my experience, one of the things that hasn't changed is that this conversation is still one of the main things they're interested in, um, relationships of any kind. Um, and my and my second uh, reason I think this is our place to have this conversation um, is that I think it's also the number one place that can cause them harm. Like, and some of that harm lasts a really long time, you know. Um, all of us get a bit battered, bruised from relationships of all kinds, and some of those scars last a really long time. So, actually, if we can support them, I think we should. My third reason why I think it's our place is that if not us, who? You know, like, yes, maybe they're friends, but we can't rely on that being very um, reliable information. Um, school, hopefully, but as I said, like our education system for SHRE is really hit and miss. Um, 
And also it focuses on certain things, you know, prevention, on, on, the, on, on health a lot of time, not necessarily about values or relationships or uh, choices or worth or all sorts of things. Um, parents maybe, but not always, sometimes there's big generation gaps. And let's face it, I mean, I've never told my parents anything about my love life. I still don't tell my parents that much about my love life, I don't know. So, you know, there are gaps sometimes depending on who your parents are. Um, and then obviously the biggest one that's a bit scary is porn. Porn and YouTube. Like, if they're not getting it, that, that's probably one of the first, one of the few various places people do um, end up going to. And at best, you know, it's inaccurate and capitalist. And at worst, you're right. <laughs> at worst, it's outright dangerous. Like some of it. So actually, um, you know, you know, I think my fourth reason why I think this is our place is that we absolutely have something to offer. Um, we have something valuable to offer. Um, and in my experience of working in both secular and Christian spaces, I think I can see that both sides need something of what the other have got. Like in the church side, we're all about values. Often, we're all about identity. We're all about um, worth, but sometimes lacking the practical and uh, the you know consent or the STD, STDs or pregnancy or whatever. Whereas the secular side is all about the practical stuff and about staying safe and pregnancy, but sometimes misses the values and the identity and the worth and, and things like that. So we we have something valid and unique to offer in this conversation, um, you know, and that message that they are loved and that they are valued and accepted and known exactly as they are, and that their value is not determined by their appearance, their perceived sexiness, their body count, how well they fit in, that's an invaluable message that actually they're not going to get from anywhere else. So, you know, and so, um, and just to bring it in the Bible and the conversation, you know, Jesus said that the greatest commandment, a new command I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another, loved you so lot of time there. You know, what is the loving thing we can do? How can we love our young people best through having this conversation? Yeah. So, first interactive bit. So, what would the loving thing look like? That's my question to you. So, what three, someone wants to start with this. What three words come to mind when you think about how the church deals with sex and relationships? So, as a very broad term, you know, just think of the things that, that come up to us. You don't have to be led by these, but these are obviously songs where we put these in. Like, um, so yeah, and as, as you add words, it will create a word cloud. So if you put the same ones in again, they will get bigger. So it's a really cool way we can just, as a group, think about, actually, yeah, if you haven't got onto Menti yet, do follow the QR code. Okay, we've got a few more coming. Different words. Come on, because we are talking, I'm, I'm being quite broad here in terms of the church and like, and history, historically I suppose. And maybe from my own experience there's all sorts of things. But yeah, I'll give you a couple more minutes. Some people on my phones are So I need like, that music they had downstairs that was like, <laughs> while we wait. <laughs> like the, the Kahoot music that's just like waiting for you. <laughs> Anyone else going for it? Oh, give more. Oh, more. Yeah, see how big that shame word is getting. Mm. Fantastic. So yeah, so we've got things like strict, controlling, avoiding, alone, badly, awkward. Shame is the biggest one there. That's really interesting. We'll pick up on that. And realistically, poor, fear, si silence. This is my big one. Silence. I think that's so true. If we don't know what to do, we just don't. It just gets not talked about, you know. Um, exclusion, judgmental. None of this is positive. We have the eyes. Our first thing is when, mm, not positive. That's probably why we're here, to be honest, in this conversation. Um, yeah, it is historically, I think, for various things, we can see that we can do better, right? We can do better, we can love people better. Um, so, quick polls. We can do this with hands instead of anything like um, So, did you hear sex discussed from the front of your church ever? Oh, oh yeah, like maybe not. Oh, what? Yeah, it's when we were watching my niece's wedding. Oh, the wedding, yeah. I thought we were going to try and for it as well. And the thing is, you know, they gave a talk. It said, and I hope you continue enjoying sex right into your um, your 80s or something. Oh, I'm pretty good. But at the same time, you were like, oh, yeah. Did you hear that? Um, so yeah, so we have a, the poll was basically from the front, not so much. Uh, 
um, different, slightly different. Did you hear sex discussed in youth group settings or as a part, as a part of the main programming? Not like casual conversations, not like uh, like disciple, like a like small group, but as your main programming. The, I mean, maybe small group is your main programming, that's fine. So, did you hear it in the youth group settings? Yeah. Okay, yeah, a bit of a mixed, more, a bit more conversation there, because let's face it, that has always been a topic of conversation in youth spaces. Um, a bit more. Okay, did you hear, or do you hear, sex discussed in informal ways at church, in church settings? So that could be friends, discussion groups, mentoring, you know. I mean, obviously, I'm not talking like marriage prep, that's kind of probably an obvious one, but um, informal ways? Yeah. Okay, so some. Yeah. But the adult church not doing so well is what we're kind of feeling about. Um, did you hear sex discussed in informal ways in youth group settings, hangout time, discussion groups, mentoring? A few more nodding heads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gets a little bit more conversation in youth spaces for sure. Oh, uh, yeah, and I just want to give you an opportunity for any thoughts there. We could obviously have that conversation in the room, but if you'd rather type it and that's like give us a comment about that, that, that what we're just hands up and stuff, you're more than welcome. I don't know if anyone's got any comments. I just remember my experience when I was in youth group, which was quite a long time ago now, but we, when we were talking about the subject of sex, it was, we were all, you know, 15, 16, 17, and then there was a, a married couple about, I mean, late 50s, early 60s discussing it, and totally irrelevant to us, and, and nobody really paid attention, I think. I'm hoping things have changed a lot since then, but I felt that was really bad, you know, it wasn't a good way to do it. Yeah, super interesting. I, I think the whole, like I'm an Anglican, I think they, the whole problems we're having with the love and faith and sex, same sex relationships, is just, it's caused, it's, we, we don't discuss it in church for fear of... So that become really complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, then, but just say, when we ran the, when we ran the Living Love and Faith course, that was really good. But it's almost like, again, you have, you created a safe space to have raw conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now, you're not quite sure what the safe space is outside of that, maybe, as well. Yeah. Sorry, you can say something. Um, I think it's not talked about as much in adulthood because more people are married and the um, it's assumed that it, it's all it's assumed it's all sorted once you're married. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas actually no, it's not going process. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's not just a case of like don't have sex before marriage. Like that's not the whole <laughs> There's <laughs> more. Yeah. yeah. And actually there is more and if we're not talking about more, we're doing people a disservice, isn't it, actually? But we have definitely put things in boxes. And then we also as a culture put people in boxes. You're single, you're married, yay, you have children. There's a big gap, and then there's a song that's like not a lot else in terms of what we talk about. Um, yeah, it's really, really interesting. Um, and I, I really relate to your experience of um, abuse group settings because I, I think that's it. it's such an important conversation of what, how we saw or have experienced sex and relationships talked about in church because we're now the ones, it, it, it has informed how we've done it. So, yeah, fantastic. Um, okay. So, I mean, just another question I'll ask someone if you want to type it in. It, regarding the ways in which the church talked about sex relationships, what was helpful? Like, can you remember? I mean, if you can't think of anything helpful, fine. But, you know, in, in the way that you experience it, where you are, or where you have them, what was actually helpful? Have you got any really positive memories of that kind of conversation? Yes, hey, I, I, I would say it's, um, I would find it more helpful when you're in smaller groups. I, mm. I find if you're having a something from the front, it's, it's not, it's, I don't know, it, it's not something you need to hear a, a big lecture about. <laughs> yes, there's some pluses and minuses as well there. Because yeah. I, uh, yeah, I think my, my conversation about, my interest in whether it's at the front is I think it feeds into a culture of silence if no one mentions this at all. Yeah. Um, but as you say, actually it is a private conversation and actually it's a sensitive conversation. Um, yeah, so marriage prep. Was actually have I think that was actually you know low, I often think with secular friends it's a weird thing to call people secular and non secular you know what I mean but actually you think you know what you could have done with a bit more of a prep before you got married <laughs> and I think sometimes the fact that we do do often ask people to encourage people to do marriage prep courses is quite helpful um, marriage prep is a good thing yeah God given oh for enjoyment that enjoyment was actually mentioned wonderful that's <laughs> that's um, yeah. Um, okay, so what's so a few things that were helpful? Absolutely. Has anyone else got a few more things to go for? Maybe? No? Great, we'll move on. Okay. So a few things that were helpful. These are things I want to keep. Regarding the road to the church about sex and nations, what was harmful? What do you think was harmful? 
that's significant and that is to get married and have children in this, in, in this way, um, when actually you don't, not everyone's like to fit into those boxes. Mm -hmm. But also, the, so the jokes and negative comments also devalue the marriage relationship. Also true, it yes. De devalues the other person. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, only boys masturbate, it was shameful, absolutely. Conversations about pleasure in general is, is, is pretty shut down. Um, and yeah, the very gendering nature of what those kind of things are. Shame in general, all of us are secret shame. Um, as an old single woman, I don't exist in conversations about sex and relationships apart from you should get married. Yeah, absolutely. And there's completely, as I said, completely different valid ways of living. And actually, again, if you don't fit these boxes, it can be very difficult. Oh, now I've got a towel open. Okay. Um, focus on romantic relationships only and no teaching exploring relationships, family, friends, and mentors. Yeah, there are lots of different ways that people can have really sustainable, fulfilling relationships, and it's the, the emphasis always seems to go on one way of living, which is a challenge. Um, so, some of these are things that we, we need to recognise and move on from, isn't it? Like, they haven't always been the best for us. Good intentions, right? We can recognise there have been good intentions around this kind of teaching. But you know what? Sometimes we're wrong. Some, we know this in the church. Sometimes we're wrong about stuff. Um, but actually, we've got to move forward in different ways. Um, and, if we, and there's lots of, obviously, lots of theology, but theologies we can hold on different attributes for sex and relationships. Um, but, you know, especially if we're going to hold a um, conservative, no sex before marriage uh, standpoint, I do think you've got, this is only my personal opinion, but I do think we've got to find a way to teach that in a way that's loving, um, honest, sex positive, body positive. Because if we don't, all we're doing is just dumping shame on people, um, which we have seen, you know, and it's doing more harm than good. Um, because whether you're a teenage boy struggling with whatever urges you have, or whether you're a young couple on their, on their wedding night, or an older couple on their wedding night, um, for the first time, we are not helping anyone out, because actually, it's, it's, there's so much shame there. Um, okay, so here's one of the sort of things I think that we think, I think young people we can probably all recognise some people need to get. So, I'm going to go through it in a minute, but you know, I think, that, I think things that they need to get their head around, safety, consent, healthy relationships, identity, communication, LGBTQIA plus community. Don't freak out where they're going to get, they're going to go. But so I think they're the things I think we need, they need to get. They're the things Ooh, that we go back to say more. Say more. Say more. So if they're the things that they need to get, they're the things that we need to get. Do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, so regardless of our theology or our, our, our practice regarding that, um, I think, yeah, these are things that actually we can, we can all work out to get our head around. Um, safety, whether that is, you know, talking about sexual health or online safety or safety at a party or safety at a festival. We've all been there, but we just don't know where they are. Um, that's what well, maybe not, but I have certainly. Um, you know, there's lots of things about safety that they need to get, but sometimes they don't get that they're at risk, right? Like, I've had that conversation so many times, they think it's fine because nothing bad happened this time, but you know. Um, consent, this is a huge one, a uh, conversation that gets had a lot at the moment, and this is one I think that can really leave scars when it's mishandled, right? Um, because so many people don't get consent, you'd be amazed how many times I've had conversations with teenage boys where they don't understand if you pass to someone over the course of an evening and eventually they say yes, that's not consent, <laughs> that's coercion. Um, they, don't, they don't get that. Um, and how many people don't realise that there needs to be consent within a committed relationship? Um, that's not just a blanket yes. You, you know that um, this, this statistic this date shocked me when I was uh, making sure I had my dates right for this. Um, rape within marriage was only criminalised in 1992 in the UK. So it was still legal to rape your partner within marriage until 1992. Cause, probably because no one thought to decriminalise it, because it's just assumed. Um, which is shocking. But on consent, I just want to show you, you might have seen this video before. Hopefully, I've only got this scene. Yeah. See the tea video? Yeah. yeah it's oh, it's so nice. funny. Yeah. I was doing it to my own people the day, and they were like, they just thought it was hilarious. I don't know how to see it. So it's just a little video that shows you, like, talks to consent in a little obvious way. Um, we use it in the C card quite a lot. Um, the, big, the sound isn't great, but you should be able to hear it. If you're still struggling with consent, just imagine instead of initiating sex, you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my god, I would love a cup of tea, thank you. Then you know they want a cup of tea. <laughs> if you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. 
then you can make them a cup of tea or not, but be aware that they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important bit, don't make them drink it. Just because you made it doesn't mean you're entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say, no thank you, then don't make them tea at all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, okay? They might say, yes please, that's kind of you. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. Sure, that's kind of annoying, as you've gone to all the effort of making the tea, but they remain under no obligation to drink the tea. They did want tea, now they don't. Some people change their mind in the time it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea and add the milk. And it's okay for people to change their mind, and you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they're unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea, and they can't answer the question, do you want tea? Because they're unconscious. Okay, maybe they were conscious when you asked them if they wanted tea, and they said yes. But in the time it took you to boil the kettle, brew the tea and add the milk, they are now unconscious. You should just put the tea down, make sure the unconscious person is safe. And this is the important part again. Don't make them drink the tea. They said yes then, sure. But unconscious people don't want tea. If someone said yes to tea, started drinking it, and then passed out before they finished it, don't keep on pouring it down their throat. Take the tea away. Make sure they are safe, because unconscious people don't want tea. Trust me on this. If someone said yes to tea around your house last Saturday, that doesn't mean they want you to make them tea all the time. They don't want you to come around to their place unexpectedly and make them tea and force them to drink it, going, but you wanted tea last week, or to wake up to find you pouring tea down their throat, going, but you wanted tea last night. If you can understand how completely ludicrous it is to force people to have tea when they don't want tea, and you are able to understand when people don't want tea, then how hard is it to understand when it comes to sex? Whether it's tea or sex, consent is everything. And on that note, I'm going to make myself a cup of tea. <laughs> it's a great little video. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the nice thing about it is that, that, that comment, if you can realise how ridiculous it is to force someone to, tip, to, like, to, have, to force them to have tea, you can get consent. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's helpful because it always makes people laugh. It's like the most British thing ever. <laughs> like, you know, have a cup of tea. Um, but, but you did, but you did something like fell over in our village of Shizuraka, but right, people were bringing it. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> she doesn't want tea, she has to go to the hospital. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, I say it's really useful because it, like, the little videos like that, there are tons of these kind of things around and like actually they're really helpful to spark conversation because mm -hmm. you might not be able to get a young person to sit down and you talk about stuff, but they will watch this and they will find it funny. Um, and it might, maybe you can spark a lot of conversations. Mm -hmm. Let's say I use it as a part of the C card conversation and we get to consent. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, I'll watch it. Like, you know, my phone is pretty pathetic, but um, it's quite useful. Um, yeah, so, consent. Um, complicated, but an important conversation. A really important conversation to be had. Um, and a bit more complicated than it was before. I mean, you now have all sorts of digital versions of where, where consent can be withdrawn as well, so it's a challenge. Um, healthy relationships. I think this is one that we actually get sad on a lot of the time. Not always, but we are quite good at it in church in general. Um, I think it's really important that we have conversations about what is what is healthy and what healthy looks like, um, because we cannot assume that that is obvious. Uh, you know, abusive and grooming situations ca can come about because they didn't know what a red flag was. They thought that was just what maybe that's what a relationship is. That's what you're supposed to do for somebody or whatever. Um, and you know, what they're consuming content-wise can be quite challenging in this. You know, there's a lot of TV shows and music that gives warped ideas of what a healthy relationship looks like and what a relationship goals look like. Um, and uh, what ideas are sexy and exciting are everything from Disney to Twilight to Riverdale to Love Island um, has a slightly, there's, there's problematic parts of all of those. I mean, now I look at some of the Disney videos I watch as a child and I think, that is so bad. Like, my favourite movie was The Little Mermaid as a child. That's a pretty awful reflection. She gives up her voice to get the guy, and like, it's all, it's, it's quite challenging. Um, we have these stories like 
has some happiness. A lot of stuff, as you say, doesn't really hold up anymore. Um, but they are consuming a lot of content, so they can get the world on their phone right now. Um, and what they see is how what they consider healthy isn't always healthy. Uh, or they don't realise it's a red flag. Um, yeah, and they can get themselves, especially when they're looking for belonging and acceptance, which is something that young people come to the church for, and our youth groups for, belonging and acceptance, they can get themselves into real trouble. And we all can, to be fair. Um, yeah, identity, finding their own identity, um, embracing that, um, seeking their God-given talents and uh, you know, the whole selves and knowing it's okay to do that and to be themselves and not like other people. It's a really important conversation. Um, communication, I think this is something that in general is really hard and British people are particularly bad at and we've got a lot of unlearning to do a lot of the time. Apparently it's one of the main things that sex therapists and couples therapists get questioned about they they come people come from an issue and actually it's the bit, their lack of ability to communicate is the main problem. Um, it's the main thing they have to talk people through. Um, so few please places are telling people that and young people that their voice matters and that what they want matters, what they desire matters, um, they have a voice. So let's be people who empower them, not silence them. And LGBTQIA plus community you know, that's a whole other conversation, and I'm very happy to tell you where I stand on that. Um, but actually, the main thing is that you work out, and look, you know, us as workers, as volunteers, youth workers, work out where we stand and how we want to respond. Um, because trust me, your young people care. They care a lot. Whether, and also, whether you know if you've got LGBT young people in your communities or not, because they probably will be them there, because they're always there, and because we don't know that they're there, and they don't know that they're there. If they've grown up in this culture of silence, they may not even know that that is an option for them. So they may not know until much later that that's who they were, but they are listening to every single thing we say, and they will internalise everything we say. And, they are, and if we haven't got young people who are LGBT+, plus, we do, they, they, they do have friends, and their friends care. Their friends care what we say, and they are listening, they will be allies. Um, so, I just my, 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 I implore you to work out where you stand and work out where you stand and how you want to respond before it becomes something. Before a young person comes to you and comes up to you looking for support, um, because not having done the work to think about it and to work out what, what, how you want to respond disrespects the young person in front of us because the message it says to them is that you are now a problem I've got to work through. You are an issue. Because I've had that before, and I've felt that before when I've with other people, that you're suddenly now a pastoral issue. Um, as opposed to a young person who needs support, they're a pastoral issue, that you need to go talk to other people about and get you know, <clears throat> so they become a problem. And actually, that's not, a, no young person is a problem, they are. They're a beautiful human being that we have to, we want to cultivate and support and love. Um, a beautiful creation. So, yeah, so wherever you are and your church stands on that, or your, your organisation stands on that, just be clear about it for the sake of your people so that they know what they're stepping into. Um, because there can be real harm done there. I do think, though, that we don't have a choice in the way we respond. I think we have to be accepting to them. We have to be uh, loving and yeah. open and accepting to them, whatever our personal beliefs are, that accepting them as people. Because I know young people who think that our church for this reason. For life, sometimes. It, yes. Yeah. And I think whatever our personal beliefs are, we have to say, you are loved and you are accepted here and we want you to be here. Yeah. I think that, has, that can't be a choice. I agree with you. And we do a lot of LGBTQI plus training at Frontier Youth Trust. We are quite an affirming, but we're a very affirming organisation. Um, and I think when we do a lot of kind of uh, supporting conversations around the subject, um, we, the main thing we're kind of going with is actually a lot of time, the theology is another conversation, the theologians can have that conversation and there is a lot of that conversation happening, but what the, the really important thing is to say the person in front of us, we can all agree that we want every young person in front of us to be met with love and how can we support them pastorally at that point, um, so I'm, 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 I'm with you there. Um, there is a, it's a really divided space. But the hurt is real, um, and again, the shame and the pain is real. So we don't want to, and the statistics are terrifying, because they've been brutally honest. Our young people are dying because we have told them that they that they won't ever be loved where they are, where where, where their family is, and that's really really awful. So we do we again sometimes we're wrong. The way we have responded in the past has been wrong. Some of it's been right. Some of it's been wrong. So I yeah.
Well, we are. And I say, if you want any help, help, there's lots of places where you can go get resources on that these days. Um, and like I've got resources on that if you're of different, uh, different um, denominations. I mean, the Methodists have got some fantastic stuff. Actually, they've got hundreds of stuff. If you go, you can go on their websites, it gets overwhelming. Um, the URC have got lots of stuff as well. Like, there's lots of things around. Um, and yeah, we do training on that, so do come chat to us. Um, yes, so on, on that note, we have a resource called the Diversity Dice. Um, some of you may have seen that you have, but a ch little challenge for you, this is one of the, 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 the resources we use when we do this kind of training um, around intersectionality. So I'm going to give you all a dice, and the, on each dice represents a protected characteristic from the um, uh, Equalities Act 2010. So these are protected under law. So what well, I'm going to give uh, every few of you, so I'm going to give you a pack of dice to play with, just roll it out, create a human being, and however weird and strange it comes out, there will be a human being. I have to here. There will be a human being out there who is that person. Just think about your space and how welcome would they be in your space? How would you respond to them in your space? Um, I'll put a slide up for that. Roll the dice. So yeah, we're going to allow some Jesus. We have some good conversations. Interesting conversations. Um, I say, the dice is a really good tool to put intersectionality yeah. and to remind us actually, people are one thing. Yes. Uh, they're actually yeah. many yeah. different things. Yeah. Um, and again, the human being in front of us is uh, so we, There are actually two other dice that I took out, um, which are kind of extra dice because of one that's normally around relationships and one that's normally around um, uh, economic status. But depending on your group, you don't necessarily need to talk about pregnant with children if you're talking about teenager or young people or children. Um, so or, Cheating on partner might not want, or you know, um, drug user, you might not want, depending on the context. So yeah. there are there are seven actually, but those are the main five. Yes. Would this be a, a, a useful activity to do with young people? Do you do it with young people? I you? have done it with young mm. people, um, and once you identify in different ways, find it really fascinating. It's really interesting to get them to think a bit outside the box. Um, some don't get it, some do. Because one of the activities they often do when we use it in inclusion is you kind of give them different scenarios and say, okay, so if this, young, if this person came to our church or asked your school, what would be the thing that they would struggle at school? That shocked me because a lot of them were like, actually, that one would get you bullied. And that was, they're not always the ones I would think about. So it gives you a really good eye in, into their school life. Yeah. Um, and a really good activity we often do um, with them is you think, uh, Put it into different scenarios. So you go, okay, if that person was on the bus, a bus is a really useful generalising term. Mm -hmm. How would that person experience getting a bus? And um, because depending on all the different things, you, know, you get a whole spectrum of life on the bus. Um, so that's often quite helpful. But then again, you can flip it around and you can do different perspectives. So you can say you can give them the dice and say, okay, how? Then you give them different scenarios. Say, okay, so how does uh, your church see that person? How does God see that person? Is that different? How does your friends see that person? How does your dad see that person? So it's it's really interesting to get people to think about different experiences of other people. Um, and sometimes it's, a, it's much more complex than we think. Um, yeah, so thank you for having a play with those. They are, it's interesting. But oh no, keep letting it go. Um, but yes, in terms of uh, relationships, the same. These people, people are not just one thing. There is so much more happening in their lives. Um, yeah. So, um, I'm going to, in classic Christian words, give you three things I think to take away from the main points of this. Um, uh, the first one is, oh, okay, that's tea. Uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> to educate ourselves. Um, you how do you get that? You just Google. Yes, yeah, if you just Google tea consent, <laughs> uh, obviously it comes up immediately. Um, it's really, really helpful. Thank you, YouTube. Many useful things for YouTube. Um, and if you want more resources, actually, we do sell a resource that has lots of fun kind of consent resources in there as well. Um, but yes, so uh, educate ourselves, do some training. We we all need training more in our lives in general. Like we always need to keep learning, don't we? And things do change. I'm saying those dice we just reprinted them this year. We had to update all sorts of language because they're only five years old. The language of lots of language shifted. And you will notice um, if you were paying a lot of attention that um, neurodiversity uh, is sadly missing from those dice because we, we it's in the book that there's a kind of uh, um, uh, we could do it with some dice. Yeah, you can yeah. do it with his own diet now, um, whereas uh, I, I, I has to not, and actually I mentioned it in that thing, um, in his, um, in the uh, uh, um, Saints um, uh, ADHD session earlier, that he was saying that it doesn't, people argue about whether it should be a learning disability or whether it should be something else, and like actually, 
it gets lumped under learning disability and under the dice currently so we would need to we kind of need to do a whole of the dice so there is a whole conversation about that um uh yes yeah, so things do change so actually educating ourselves keeping ourselves up to date is super important familiarize ourselves with the topics and get comfortable if it's awkward i think that's really important like i think if we're not uncomfortable it deflates them from being uncomfortable um, learn the actual words, which is really, um, really helpful because actually we get all these euphemisms and I get it slightly shames it all, all saying, actually let's learn the actual words for body parts for different things and uh, not encourage them to kind of feel ashamed about stuff, I suppose. We don't learn enough about our bodies, um, especially in education things, and we're, especially, and we are ashamed about knowing about our own bodies and actually that is very empowering information and quite devaluing, I think, to us. Um, yeah, and open our eyes to youth culture a little bit. What are they watching? Are they watching Riverdale? Actually, Riverdale's probably a bit out of heart now. It's probably moved on. Riverdale's got really ridiculous. I don't know. I started actually watching that because my teenager was watching it and very quickly became very shocked. Um, but a one of them punches a bear at one point. That's a cult. It's really weird. Um, yeah, so listening to them, finding out what they're talking about, finding out what they are um, reading, um, that kind of stuff is quite important. Um, so you can challenge stuff if stuff, stuff comes up. I definitely, when Twilight was big, I definitely had loads of young people who wanted Twilight Love. And I was like, please don't want Twilight Love. It's very warped. Um, I'm kind of creepy. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of places. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, like Angel and Buffy, like that. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's so Angel and Buffy. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, vampires. It's all vampires and watching you sleep and... Anyway, um, we'll do a summer on Twilight next time. Um, yeah, so uh, we, we can provide education on things like this, um, but uh, a really great uh, provider who is a, a Christian charity is Asset UK. I don't know if you've heard of them. It's expensive training, but it's worth it. They're really Asset. great. Asset, A S S E T, I think. Asset, A C E T. Okay, I can't spell it at all. There you go. They're great. A C E T. Andy and I often bump into that. We sit in the corner uh, talking about things with us at UK, I think, so they often the same things we're at. Um, yes, uh, and C card, which is you know a condom scheme. Most cities have a condom, free condom scheme. If you decide that that's the way you, you think you could like have that as a part of a centre, which mo basically means yes, it's a free condom and lube scheme, but they sit down with you and they have a conversation about sexual health. Um, if we have one in Nottingham, uh, it's about around my power, I don't know who yours is in, in Sheffield, um, where you, you think, just, it sets a big message that you're a safe centre to talk about conversation. Not promising they actually want to talk about it, but they, you can do that if that's the way you want to go. Um, so my next big one is trust. This one I think is huge. Um, I don't think personally any of this conversation should be done unless it's from a place of trust. Um, I think it's weird and it's awkward and it's difficult for everyone. Um, and you I mean try and say the word penis and vulva around teenagers and see how well that goes down. <laughs> the, I think it's a massive myth that they actually want to talk about this all the time. Mostly they just want to avoid it. Like they don't want to talk about it. No, they don't want to talk about it. No, they don't want to talk about it. No, absolutely. Um, so I mean I quite enjoy if they get if they make jokes trying to be like and I had and one of my colleagues has a really good thing about when you know when boys call penises on everything, he's like, Do you call that a penis? Let's make this more anatomically accurate. <laughs> and like uh, leading into the awkward is quite funny and then it kind of devolves it and again it uh, allows you to think that actually you are someone you can have a conversation with. Um, because it's also incredibly personal. Um, and sometimes I think we forget that. Like we would be shocked if they asked us about our sex life, and yet we think it's okay if we can ask them about theirs, you know. Um, it's incredibly personal, let's respect that. And last thing with C-Card, it is a one-to-one -one conversation in a room, like learning, like doing things, uh, learning about sexual health, uh, usually. Um, and let's help them respect, respect that. Um, so yeah, let's make space for open conversation, um, and build, after building strong relationships, I think it's a bit like what, um, I'm sorry, I don't really know, but this lady at this corner was saying, actually the conversation from the front isn't that helpful. It's, it's too complicated a conversation. It's too, yeah, it's quite limiting. So but the, I think the trust thing is, if we can make it clear that we're a place of safety, that actually we're, we're up for conversation, um, and for a place of having built a relationship with them. Um, and they don't question stupid. That's what I find mm. stupid. Absolutely. Sometimes I'm like, they don't want to ask it because they think everyone else knows this thing, but actually I really need to know this thing. Yeah. Say, 
know, things like this where you can make the, con the questions a bit anonymous. I mean, I'm, we all want, like an idea of an anonymous sex question box, but it doesn't really ever work. But being able, as you say, to create space for um, stupid questions, or not stupid questions, but any questions is helpful. Um, yeah, so I'm not a fan of, oh dear, I'm not a fan of the conversation from the front. Um, but so I also think it leads to my next point, that actually if we're going to have this conversation, it has got to be trauma-informed. Um, these days especially, that this is a triggering subject. And if we talk about it from the front, you don't know, just with one message. I mean, I know a balanced conversation, lots of different things, for sure. Um, but one message from the front is a really challenging thing. Because you don't know who you've got in the room, or even if you do know who you've got in the room, or what those experiences are, many, many people will have experienced very real harm associated with some of these subjects, small or big. Um, with sex and relationships, um, we don't have history. So I would always recommend to give a trigger warning um, before you do it, uh, if you're doing these conversations, even if it means that the week before, it means that actually someone might going to turn up because they want to think it's all good. You know them, you can follow up with them. Sorry, I just let you Thank you. Um, yeah, you can, if, if someone doesn't turn up to that, you can, you're there, you know, you, you see them regularly, you can follow up with them and find out why, or, you know, or see if they want to have a conversation separately, or not. Um, but, and, and it is a shame when you, you scope for something and they don't turn because they don't want to have a conversation. But maybe it means you've got to save the room for those who do, I don't know. Um, but I think it's always giving people an out is really important, and approach every subject with this in mind. Um, with my planning, you know, many trans people will find it very emotionally painful to talk about body parts. They just, they do. There's lots of really complex stuff going on there. And many um, women abuse survivors will find it very difficult, if not impossible, to talk about any of these subjects with a man in the room. You, you just don't, you know, we have to work out what's going to be the safest thing for people. Um, and in that respect, again, more training. There is bits of trauma-informed stuff going around these days, but it's definitely worth looking into. Um, yeah. Um, Dismantle shame, which we've talked about quite a bit. Um, shame is corrosive. I think it takes so much therapeutic work to kind of unpick, which many of us will know. Um, and I have known people have very difficult first years of their marriage because they have shamed sex their whole life, and then on, you know it's been a bit of like a, behind a closed door, and then they're expected to flip the switch to good on their marriage <laughs> on their wedding night, and it's been very very difficult for people to um. To undo that sometimes um, because that was the only way they could do it so uh, we've got to yeah oh and I've seen this is another example I've seen countless young people give up completely on God because they have broken one rule and they're, they're dirty they think they're written off so actually they can't be a Christian anymore I talk about throwing the baby out with bathwater like that message that actually you're loved, you've made decisions, maybe you made mistakes, maybe, maybe like, or that you're allowed to have that conversation, you actually have to hold things, or you have to wrestle with things. You know, it's a journey, like, that gets lost, and like, no, no, you're, there's no, I think you said something about, earlier about, um, um, oh, I can't what you said, but it was, it was good. Um, <laughs> about, um, grace, and yeah, the conversation, there's more, that there's sometimes more than that. Um, yeah, and actually that's not what we want. We don't want people thinking they're cut off from God because of one, one part of the theology. Um, Seems to be a lot associated with that particular sin. You know, there's loads of sins. And it's been elevated to yeah, more yeah. Yes. yeah, we don't talk about theft or, or you know, other... Lying. Yeah, lying or anything, it's just like sex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there seems to be no recovery from it if, you've done, if you're not virgin, that's it. Yeah. And, and actually, you know, you're, we're all imperfect. And yeah. God loves you completely. Yes, it does seem to be a bit of a misunderstanding of mm -hmm. the concept of sin. We're deciding there's a hierarchy, yeah. necessarily. Um, and that one thing is going to uh, dismantle your relationship with one another. Yeah, absolutely. We hit the, I mean, there's lots of conversation about historically where the sex, the shame and sex thing you can go all about talking about St. Augustine and like you know and lots of patriarchy conversations about where sit, sex has become such a thing and obviously there's the practicalities of those those type of rules in different areas and the world like history. Um, but yes we have definitely gone very far with that one. Um, yeah because we are human human sometimes it's like there's no space in church for us to be human. And to be messy. Sometimes it's messy. Relationships aren't straightforward. People aren't straightforward. Sometimes it's messy. And uh, yeah, we need to be, it's a very high bar for wanting people to sometimes. Um, so yeah, we need to create open environments where young people can know they can come to us. 
I think, you know, that they know that they will be safe with us. No matter whatever they say, being unshockable is, I, I think I've just about perfected the, I am absolutely, you can say anything to me and I'm not going to react even if I'm panicking in my brain book. <laughs> just about, but not always. Um, I think safeguarding does that a bit as well, doesn't it? Safeguarding training is like actually work out how to be, be to not react to someone saying it's really shocking to you as well, because it can be cause more the, the, the look of shock on your face can cause more damage, more problems. Um, so yeah, but they know they can be safe with us. They know there's a way back, and that they know they won't be judged, just loved. Um, judgment is a horrible, horrible feeling. Um, yeah, know that we're loved and cared for. Um, so. Yeah, it's a hard line to get right, but it comes from, again, building trusting relationships, I think. That's the biggest one. Mm-hmm. Um, and if nothing else, we need to just talk about it more, or be open to the fact that, we, that this, the subject exists and it's okay to talk about it, if they want to talk about it. Because a culture of silence is helping no one and damaging so many people. Um, so that's how we love them, I think. That would be the loving thing. Um, then we might have time, how about one more word for if you want to do it quickly. You know, at the beginning we were like, one type of three words about how the church has like, has been, like, how has it responded to sex relationships. What would be the dream? What would the words be? Actually, if, if we could create a culture where young people uh, around how they were, were taught about sex relationships, what would be the, what would be the dream? What are the words? Because um, earlier we had things like shame and quiet and alone. What would be the opposite? What would be that, the actual dream of what we want them to feel and know? Um, Loving support, celebration, diversity. Oh, I love celebration. Mm-hmm. Because that's actually what we do to run in church. We celebrate, you know, when you get married and stuff and children, we do celebrate. We just don't always celebrate everything. We just narrow selection of what we mm-hmm. celebrate, you know? Um, loved, welcoming, these are beautiful, accepted, loving support, valued, open, inclusive, lovely. 12 responses, that's probably as many people in the room. You see? Yeah. Amazing. That would be a lovely world. Mm. Welcoming. Loving is the big one there. It feels like, and that doesn't feel like the core of what makes um, this particular faith perspective distinctive is that we're called to love people, love people in front of us. And no matter what we disagree on with everything else, because you know, some of those arguments in our theology are important arguments, they are. Um, but the one thing we all can re- reflect, recognise is that we are called to love and that we are loved. That loving thing is the thing. We'll come back to that over and over again. No shame, it's wonderful. That is all we have time for. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, yeah, I'm going to put this here. Please give me my little dice back, that'd be really helpful. Um, if you want pet bog bit of fun, you can get them on our website um, at fyt.org.uk. Uh, yeah, and just say, do chat to say we do do more training and things like this for anyone wants to have it. And um, I say, if you want to have any, we've run out of time for questions, if you want to have a chat about with me about anything, I'll be here for a bit longer.